Moving on, we have our third application of a Gauss law. And like before, here also we are going to use Gauss law and find the electric field. But this time, due to an infinitely large, thin, charged plane sheet. Let me show you how this diagram is drawn. So as per as our topic, we have drawn here an infinitely large plane sheet which is charged with let's say positive charges and of course in this diagram it looks like as if it is finite sheet but actually this is infinitely large. <clears throat> from these positive charges we expect the electric lines of force to go away from each other and as a result you will notice these lines are drawn perpendicular to the plane sheet itself. As we cannot have any lines moving from one positive charge to the other positive charge the possibility of this line, the possibility of this line is not there. We imagine the distribution of charges here to be uniform because of which we can define the surface charge density here given by the charge present per unit area. Next what we are required here to do is that we are going to find electric field at a certain point, let's call it P, which is at certain distance, let's say R, from the charge sheet. Now in order to find this electric field, we are going to use Gauss law. And you have seen that we can apply Gauss law only if we have a closed surface. For simplicity, in this case, we are going to take a Gaussian surface or closed surface in the form of a cylinder. That cylinder we are going to draw in such a way that the end cap of the cylinder will contain this point P. The cylinder that we are choosing will pass through this plane sheet and appear from the other side of the plane sheet as well. Notice this cylinder we have drawn it of finite shape or size and I can call this end cap as our end cap number one. I've called this end cap as your end cap number two and this is basically your curved part of the cylinder. If you look at our diagram now you can make out that the charges are enclosed by the cylinder which are present within this area of the cylinder. These charges are not inside the cylinder, but I can say the charges are enclosed by the cylinder which are present in only this area. The area of this end cap, we have taken it to be equal to capital A. You could have also written pi r square, but then you have to write the radius of this end caps. For the time being, we do not do that. We simply take directly the area of this end cap as A. Now if you look at our diagram, you can make out that this electric lines of force that we have drawn, they are coming out of this end cap number 1. The electric lines of force are also coming out from end cap number 2. However, if you look at the curved surfaces, these lines do not come out of the curved surface as we do not have these lines here. Or I can say the electric lines of force are running parallel to the curved surface. Hence, the flux is only through the end caps and not through the curved surface. So you can see your notes we have written we have taken a thin infinitely large plane sheet which is charged such that the density of charges is your sigma. Point P is such a point that we want to find the electric field intensity at a distance r from the charges and we have also drawn the Gaussian surface in the form of a cylinder to which we are going to apply Gauss law. Now this cylinder as I told you if I take this to be R, then this will be again your R. So the length of the cylinder is your twice R. And we have taken A as the area of the end cap. On the end caps, we have taken point P and Q. And I can say that both these points are equivalent points. Next, if we apply Gauss law now, we will get flux through the cylinder should be given by 1 by epsilon naught times the charge enclosed by the cylinder. And you know, sigma is equal to charge per unit area. I can write charge is equal to sigma into area and I will take only those charges which are within this area as rest of the charges are not enclosed. Now as I have taken the area here to be A, I can simply write sigma into A and that must give me the charge enclosed by this cylinder. So you can see we have done that in equation 1. In place of charge enclosed, we have written sigma into A. Also, we use the definition of our electric flux to again find the flux through the whole cylinder. And we must write 
the flux through the cylinder which represents the lines coming out from the cylinder should be equal to the lines coming out from the end cap number one end cap number two and the curved surface so we have written correspondingly the formulas for them this E here represents an electric field at any point on the end cap number one this E here represents the electric field at any point on the end cap number two and this field E represents any electric field on the curved surface of our cylinder similarly this ds vector that we have represents a small elemental area vector on the end cap number one this ds vector represents small elemental area on the end cap number two and this ds represents small elemental area vector on the curved surface when i look at end cap number one you can make out the electric lines of force were in this direction that's why we have the electric field along the right or towards the right and at point p suppose if we take a small elemental vector your ds vector which is on the end cap one i can easily say that the angle made by the ds vector and the e vector for your end cap number one is zero degree because of which you can see we have written here cos of zero degree similarly if i go to your end cap number two which is this if i choose a small elemental area vector I can say that the small elemental vector is pointing to the left and even the electric field lines here is pointing to the left because of which the angle between the E vector and the DS vector again at point like Q is going to be 0 degree. Hence we have written cos of 0 degree. <clears throat> and finally for your curved surface which is to this part, if you take any elemental area on this curved surface. I can say that right now this curved surface is pointing upwards whereas the electric field lines are towards the right. So clearly the angle between the E vector and the DS vector for this curved part or the elemental area vector on this curved part is your 90 degree. That is true for even if I take a curved part somewhere here it will be pointing down and our electric field will be towards the right. So clearly for any curve surface or any part of the curved surface the electric field and the ds vector there are going to make an angle of 90 degree because of which you can see we have written the angle is 90 degree this cos 90 is going to make this whole term equal to zero this is simply going to get us eds eds this e is the electric field on the end cap number one at point p this e is the electric field at end cap number two like your point q and as you know the electric field at point P and Q must be same because they were equivalent points because of which I can take both this E to be same and constant of course and can be taken out of the integration. So we simply get twice of this. Now we simply need to integrate ds over our end cap number 1 and we are going to get twice Ea because this term here means that we must add all the ds that is your small small area vectors present in our end cap number one and once we do that we should get the total area of this end cap and as i told you the total area of this end cap has been taken as a so the integration of this is going to lead us or give us the total area of the end cap number a which is your a so we have calculated the flux using our gauss law which is equation one and we've also calculated our electric flux from the same cylinder using the definition of the flux which is equation two we are simply going to equate the two equations and we can write twice Ea equals to 1 by epsilon times sigma into A. From here you can see we can cancel both the areas and we are going to get half sigma by epsilon naught. It's a very important relation. You will see many applications of this in different situations. But for the time being let me tell you the important point. This clearly shows that our E is directly proportional to sigma. That means if the plane sheet has density or let's say a bigger density, what you expect at point P is to have a bigger electric field. And one more thing you can note here is that the electric field for an infinitely large sheet is independent of the distance because you can see there is no R appearing in the formula. That means the electric field is independent of the distance of the point from the charge sheet, which means if you calculate electric field at point like your let's say P1 and if you calculate the electric field at a point like your P2 which is very far, you are not going to get different electric field values but you will get the same electric field as we have seen 
the electric field does not depend on the distance. That means the electric field here and the here are going to be same. Some important points here to note are, number one I've already discussed, number two is independent of the distance, that also I've discussed just now. Number three, if the sigma is positive, that means we have positive density of charges, then the field is normally outward. But if we have a negative density of charges, that means negatively charged particles on the charge sheet, then the fields are going to be directed normally inward. And finally, we have this very nice problem here. Suppose the sheet is not a very thin sheet, but let's say it has some width. In that case, you can imagine the sheet to have positive charges on this face as well as you can have charges on the other face. Now since the, both the charges on both the faces are positive, at a point like your P, I can say that E1 is the electric field due to this face, I can say E2 is the electric field due to the other face, and since the distance does not matter, both the electric fields are going to be same provided the densities are same. So if the first face has a density sigma, the other face also has a density sigma, I can write half sigma by epsilon naught plus another half sigma by epsilon naught because you have seen if there is only one sheet here or charge sheet, the value of electric field here was half sigma by epsilon naught. But since I take another sheet of positive charges which is equivalent to our this diagram, I can have to take another electric field which is half sigma by epsilon naught and right now we have to add them because both the electric fields are pointing in same direction that is away from both the density of charges. Hence when I add both of them, I am going to get full sigma by epsilon naught. Next we have this problem which we can do. The question is a charge of 17.7 into 10 to the power minus 4 coulombs is uniformly distributed over a large sheet of area 400 meters square. So they have given here area you can see and they have given the charge present on the sheet which is 17.7 into 10 to the power minus 4 coulombs. The question is to find the electric field intensity at a distance of let's say r equal to 10 centimeters. Our problem is about the derivation that we have done just now, but clearly this, but clearly this plane sheet has been given right now a finite shite, size, a finite size, whereas we have, whereas we have done the derivation for a infinitely large sheet. To tell you, the formula that we have derived can be applied even if the charge sheet is not infinite in size but finite in size. Hence we can write E must be equal to half sigma by epsilon naught which is equal to half sigma is your charge per unit area and I must multiply with epsilon naught. I am going to put the value of Q as 17.7 into 10 to the power minus 4 divided by area which is 400 meter squares. Epsilon naught is 8.854 into 10 to the power minus 12. When I do this, I'm going to get the electric field in newtons per coulomb and the answer comes out to be 10 to the power minus 1 newtons per coulomb. Please check, uh, maybe I've made some mistake over here. So I guess this is the value of electric field and it cannot have meter here. So I want you to go through it and check whether you can get this value or you're going to get a different value. Next, we have a very nice problem. Often asked in your boards, both in CBSC and MBOS. Let me explain to you both the questions, then we'll proceed. The question says, we have a positive charges distributed over a plane sheet and a negative charges distributed over a plane sheet with densities plus sigma and minus sigma, such that we are required to find the electric field in this region called 1, let's say at point P1, in the region 2, that is your in between these two charge sheets, or let's say at point P2, and finally, at a point like your P3 which is on the right side of your negative charge sheet. So we have to find the electric field at point P1, P2 and P3. And in the next question you will see, we have two plane sheets again. Both are positively charged sheets with densities plus sigma and minus sigma. And we are again to find the electric field at point P1, point P2 and point P3. What we are going to do is that, since we have already derived the formula for electric field due to a single sheet, we are going to apply that when we have more than one sheet. You can see here we have the first one. Let's first find the electric field at this point, let's say P1. Now 
who creates electric field at point P1? We know these positive charges present in the first sheet will create electric field at P1, which should be away from the positive charges. So we have written E plus, and that is the direction of your E plus. Also, the negative charges present in the second sheet also creates electric field at point P1. That is we have represented by your E minus, and that should be towards the negatively charged sheet. Clearly you can see the E plus and the E minus that we have are both opposite in direction. And when we write the magnitude of these two, I must write half sigma by epsilon naught for E plus because of the first sheet. Again, half sigma by epsilon naught for the second sheet, which is the electric field here again. And clearly, these two numbers are equal because the electric field we have seen is independent of the distance. Though the plus charges or positive charges, though the positive charges were near to this point and the negative charges were far from this point, even though the electric field created by both the sheets are same. But obviously their direction, you can see it's opposite right now for your point P1. So we are going to write the vector equation, which is your simply net vector or net electric field must be a sum of both the fields. But when I write the magnitude, I must take the magnitude of the first one and subtract with the magnitude of the other one because they are oppositely directed and I'm going to get an answer of zero. That means you expect here no electric field or zero electric field in this region called one. Then if I go to your next problem, to find the electric field at point P2, which is in between these two charge sheets, you can see the positive charges will create electric field, even the negative charges will create electric field at point P2. Due to the positive charges, the electric field, we will call it E plus, and it should be away from the positive charges. That means towards the right. And due to the negative charges, the electric field again should be to the right, or let's say towards the negative charges. Clearly, you can see the E plus and the E minus in this case are in same direction because of which the magnitude or the net electric field will be given by the addition of the magnitude of E plus and E minus. So we have written the vector equation again with a plus sign, of course. Earlier also we had plus sign, even though they were in opposite direction, we have to write a plus. But when we actually do the math, if they were opposite direction, we have to subtract their magnitudes. And if they are same direction, we have to add their magnitudes. So clearly I have written here half sigma by epsilon naught due to let's say the first positive sheet, half sigma by epsilon naught again due to the negative sheet, add them and I'm going to get sigma by epsilon naught. This you will notice you're going to use that is a sigma by epsilon naught in a topic called capacitors where you will see the electric field between the place of a capacitor is given by sigma by epsilon naught. So we have got the electric field at point P2, or let's say region number two. Finally, to find the electric field at a point such as your P3, again, we write E plus in this region number three should be away from the positive charges and the E minus should be towards the negative charges. Clearly the E plus and the E minus will have same magnitude of half sigma by epsilon naught. As I told you again, the distance doesn't matter. But obviously, in this case, E plus and E minus are again in opposite direction. So we have written, hence we subtract the magnitude of E plus and E minus, and again, we are going to get zero. So what you have learned just now is that, if you have two charge sheets, one positive and one negative, with equal densities of plus sigma and let's say minus sigma, then in a region which is this, your region one, we expect to have a zero electric field, that happens for even your region number three, which is where you get electric field at zero. But at a region like your number two, which is in between these two charge sheets, we get an electric field equal to sigma by epsilon naught. Next, the problem B that I've read the question already, I told you what is the difference. Both the charge sheets are now positively charged. So they have a density of plus sigma and plus sigma again. At a point P, or let's say region one, the positive charges will create electric field in this direction due to the first sheet. Even the negative, even the other positive sheet will create electric field in the same direction because you know the electric field from the positive charges should be away from the positive charges. And you can see this E plus and this E plus are both equal in magnitude and same in direction. 
equal to half sigma by epsilon naught, half sigma by epsilon naught. Hence, the total field will be given by sigma by epsilon naught and directed along negative I cap. If you go to point like your P2, the first sheet will create electric field away from it that is in this direction and even the other sheet, the other positive charge sheet will create electric field in this direction. Let's call them again E plus and E plus but suppose if I call the first one to be E plus, the other one I have to call it E minus. Clearly when I add these two, I'm going to get a zero vector here. I cannot have a plus now this time but I will have a minus this time or without this also you can simply write half sigma by epsilon naught minus the other half sigma by epsilon naught and the electric field is equal to zero. And finally, for a point like your P3, the electric field due to this sheet will be along this direction, let's say this, and electric field due to this sheet again at this point will be along this direction. Hence, I can write E plus, again let's say E plus, so we are going to write half sigma by epsilon naught, half sigma by epsilon naught, I'm going to get full sigma by epsilon naught directed in the positive I cap direction. What you can do as a homework is that you can take a negatively charged sheet and find out the electric field at this point 1, 2 and 3. 